Welcome to Emmanuel on this Easter Sunday. We are so glad that you've chosen just to take a few moments with us. Uh, God is good and Jesus is alive. I, I want to lead you in a simple response. I'm going to say he is risen and then I want you to say where you are. He is risen indeed. He is risen. Very good. Continue to tune in to uh, Emmanuel. Obviously we can't gather in person. So on Sundays, you can uh, catch us on Facebook live at 1045 or on YouTube. And probably the best, easiest way to do that is to go on our website. It's www.ebcwv.com. And if you go all the way up above the header in the right corner, there are little logos for Facebook and a logo for YouTube. You can click on either one of those and you can get, uh, you can get our services and, and this week's as well as uh, uh, previous weeks. Um, also remember tonight, this is uh, Easter Sunday, April 12th. We're going to have a drive-in service so you can come in your cars. Um, you'll park in the back parking lot here, uh, 1711 uh, 23rd Street, uh, and um, we are going to broadcast a short service. We're, we'll sing some Easter songs. Uh, you'll be able to text in praises and uh, prayer concerns that you have, and then Pastor John's going to share a message, and we'll close with, with singing. So uh, tonight, 6 p.m., if you just want to drive by, we'll give you an FM, we'll give you an FM signal on your radio to tune to, and you can tune to that, and uh, just be, you, you can't, we can't be together in a sanctuary, but we can be in our cars in the parking lot. So you're welcome to come out for that. Every week we have some Zoom video conferences, Tuesday morning at 10, Wednesday night at 7.30. Uh, love for you to be part of that. We have a little devotion and just a time of sharing. And then one other thing, uh, Judy Prater is collecting stories that she calls Angels Among Us. And it's just simply, what have you noticed that people are doing to make a difference and to serve. And you can text her at uh, 304 615 7036 and tell her something that you've seen. And we want to collect those and just praise God for all the neat things He's doing in this time. So, again, thank you for being with us. We wanted to share with you a praise song that Emmanuel has done uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, we really like it, and as I was coming to uh, planning for Easter Sunday, this one by a song by Phil, Phil Wickham just came to mind. Uh, I hope you like it. It's called Living Hope. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living home. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom? such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of Kings calls me his own Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living home. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, 
Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Good morning and happy Easter. Thank you for worshiping along with us from your homes uh, today for our Easter service. Today, Pastor Kurt will be preaching from the book of John. And so I want to invite you to read along with me as I read from chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Let's read. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in, in, in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the, to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. May God bless the reading of his word.
with me. Father, we have uh, just sang together that our Lord is risen from the grave. And Father, we are just simply here to celebrate the reality of the resurrection. And we also are here to confess, Father, that uh, sometimes we don't feel that, especially right now, Father. Uh, we've, we feel overwhelmed. We are struggling sometimes just to get out of bed and to get through the day. All of our routines and everything we lean on seems to have gone away. But Father, all the more reason for us to take some time on this Easter Sunday to remind ourselves that you are a God who works in difficult times. And somehow, some way, through all of the craziness of this, uh, of this time, with all of the difficulties that have been brought on the country and on our families and lives through this pandemic, we know that you're going to bring good out of it. So we're just thankful to be here, and we ask that you would, you'd be present in our service by your Spirit. And now, Father, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his own disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hey everyone, I hope you're having a blessed time worshiping with us this Easter morning. So far your time together as a family has gone well. Uh, my suspicion is that a lot of you are having to celebrate this year differently than you have in the past and maybe differently than you planned on doing. Uh, maybe normally you would be sharing a meal with family members that you don't get to see very often or maybe some of you had planned to have an Easter egg hunt later on with, with your friends and, and this year uh, maybe those things aren't able to happen. Uh, and, and it's okay, uh, those things are great, those things are fun and they're important and it's okay to be a little sad that we don't get to do those things. But the good news I want to share with you all this morning and that I want to remind all of us is that the best part of Easter, the greatest gift that Easter brings, is something that can't be taken from us. It's something that, uh, that we can't cancel. Um, because over 2,000 years ago, on Easter morning, Jesus, three days after he had been crucified and, 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 and killed for us, Three days later, he came back from the dead. God brought him back to life from the dead. And he overcame the power of death. And that is the greatest gift that Easter reminds us that we have. And it's something that no one can take from us. And it's very important. Um, every year, this test goes out to people all over the country. And this test asks people to, to list all the things that they're afraid of. Like, what are the top fears that people are dealing with. And there's usually the same things year to year. People will say things like, like snakes. Snakes is always in the top 10 fears. Uh, I've got this little, uh, this little friend here. Someone left this on my office window one morning. I'm still not sure who did it, by the way. Uh, but this is a little spider, and uh, spiders are always big in the top 10 fears. Every year people are afraid of spiders. People are afraid of bees and all kinds of things like that. Um, but every year, when people take this test, one of the things that is always in the top 10 fears is death. People are afraid of dying, or they're afraid that someone they care about might die. Uh, and maybe for some of you out there, boys and girls, families, uh, maybe you know what that feels like. Maybe you're afraid of the idea of death, or you're afraid that someone you care about might die, or maybe that's something you've already had to live through, and someone you care about has passed, and you miss that person, and so the idea of death is scary. But I want you to know that that's okay. It's okay to have those feelings. It's okay to have questions, um, and it's okay to sometimes be a little afraid of that. But the gift of Easter, the most important thing about Easter, is that for the people who love Jesus, and the people who live their lives showing others that they love Jesus, we no longer have to be afraid. There is never a time where we have to be afraid 
of death because Jesus overcame the powers of death for us. And he promises us that just like God brought him back to life, God will bring us back to life. And God has promised us that he has amazing things planned for his people even after death. And so death is not the end for God's people. Death is never the end of the story for God's people. He has amazing promises for us. And even if we don't know what those will look like, even if we don't know all the details about that, we can have faith and we can have hope uh, that one day we will be with Jesus and the things that the rest of the world uh, is, is afraid of, the things that the rest of the world is worried about or anxious about, like, like spiders okay, or snakes or, or death, we don't have to be afraid of those things in the same way because of the promise of Easter. And that's something that no one can ever take away from you and that never gets canceled and that God has given to you and your families forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the hope that you have given us through the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you that this hope is different from the rest of, of, of the world, uh, from the kinds of hope that the rest of the world offers. It's not a hope that will disappoint us. It's not a hope in, in things that are temporary. You've given us a hope uh, for something that will last forever. I pray for the boys and girls and the families watching at home that they would know this hope this morning. They would know the, the worship and the rejoicing of Easter. Uh, you would remind us that you have these promises and that we don't have to be afraid because of what Jesus did over 2,000 years ago. Thank you again in Christ's name. Amen. I want to just take a moment to, uh, to thank you so much for your uh, generous giving through the month of March. Everything is different, and uh, the finance team uh, got together recently, and we weren't sure what kind of offerings we'd see in March. And the good news is, is that your giving remained uh, strong. And so we, uh, we, we feel good. Thank you for those that are mailing a gift in. Uh, I shared in my weekly uh, uh, email this week that for the first time in 38 years, Mona and I have put our giving, our tithe, uh, online. And we, we now give uh, through the uh, PushPay platform on the uh, Emmanuel website, which, by the way, uh, since we're not gathering, that might be something you'd want to consider. You go to our website. It's uh, ebcwv. Dot com. Uh, you go up into the header and hit give, and then you, there's a little line there that says, I wish to give through push pay. You click on that, and it guides you through it. So our giving is now set up uh, twice a month uh, to the church. It can be changed whenever, but uh, it's especially right now that we're not gathering. We don't have those reminders, and so uh, that's, an, uh, that's a way that we are giving. But thank you for being generous. I do want to remind you of one thing. Coming up on May 5th, uh, the Parkersburg Area Foundation sponsors a give MOV, give local MOV. And it's a time when you can give to local uh, ministries and charities and grant money will double it. I'm, I'm on the board of the Y and we're not gonna be able to have our annual fundraiser. So I'm gonna be giving some money to the Y through the give MOV May 5th. And I'm also connected to Faithlink and they can't have their annual fundraiser because it was canceled. And so uh, think about a local uh, ministry or organization like Habitat or anything. And remember that a lot of them are not able to do fundraisers that they normally do. And then think about May 5th, give MOV, and you can, you can sometimes double uh, your gift to these organizations. So thank you for your generosity. God bless you.
We want to take some time uh, to praise God and also to pray. I wanted to show you something that, uh, that I'm trying to, to do. Uh, it's real simple, but uh, we made up this sign. We love you. We are praying. God is good. And uh, for some of our older members and people uh, in care facilities, uh, you can't go in, but I, can, uh, I call ahead, make sure they're okay, and I uh, kind of can hold this up and maybe talk to them through the glass. Um, also, uh, Judy Prater brought this in, uh, and it's another thing that I can, uh, I can hold up uh, outside uh, some of our members' homes. Right now, it's just uh, so, so many people have been home and, and separated from other uh, people that, uh, you know, it's just, it's tried to do something. By the way, uh, I want you, to, um, I want you to, to, to see some drawings that uh, the Brooks Children's did. You can, uh, you can see them. Uh, you can see them here. These are pictures that they, uh, that they drew. I, and I believe these are when Jesus walked on the water uh, uh, to, to the boat and he said, take courage, it is I. So I wanted you to see, I wanted you to see those pictures. I think they did, uh, I think they did a, really, a really good job. Thank you to Rhonda Johnston who made Easter cards and we sent them out to all of our older members. Um, today at noon on Easter Sunday, Rhonda Johnson and the Alt Millers are serving the Salvation Army meal. We're grateful for that. Uh, Deb Fenton and her crew are keeping our necessity pantry open on the second and fourth Tuesdays from 10 to noon. People come by and they're getting bags of, of necessity items that are very much needed at this time. Rosewood came into the office this week and she copied and mailed Awana lessons and sent them out to her children so they could kind of keep up on their workbooks. Uh, Brenda Wheeler came in this week and helped us, help Terry Fielder, our secretary, get our April May newsletter out. Uh, Jordan Lalamont was just hired by Fiscal Services. Um, public debt for a job in human resources, and we praise God for that. Scott Whitlatch got a new job. Uh, uh, it's uh, driving a truck day shift for Grenland Transport in Marietta. That's a huge thing for them. We praise God for that. Women's Care Center got back to us, and our baby bottle fund drive raised $813, and they are very, very thankful. Um, Evan and Margaret Fries were out in front of the church this week, weeding and pruning around the roses in front of our sign. And the Bartons are sharing their Easter dinner with all of the older members of our church. And I could go on, but we just love to remember and praise God for those things that people are doing. Remember those people that are stuck in their homes or those people that are trapped in care facilities right now. Let's pray for our, our community, our state, our country, and the world as we try to get a handle on this pandemic. Pray for church members. Someone told me this week, they said, I don't want you to mention my name. But would you please pray for people that are so anxious that they're not sleeping? And I know that relates to a lot of people. And we need to pray that God would bring peace to people that are struggling. Uh, pray for Becca Brooks, who is due um, to deliver her baby on April 24th. And we're just praying everything comes together. Uh, someone in our church, uh, Bob Byers, just got out of the hospital. And we're praying for him. And uh, Betty, uh, Betty Canterbury is uh, this week went up to Columbus for her second chemo. Uh, Betty's in her 90s, and so she has a tough road ahead. We want to keep her in prayer. And then Vicki Prater, Megan Stryker, and Kimberly Wilson are all health care workers, and they have asked for prayer that they would remain safe and healthy during, during this time. Uh, join me now in a time of prayer. Father, uh, we just thank you. We thank you that we have so much to praise you for. On this Easter Sunday, Father, we could be huddled in fear the way the first disciples were behind locked doors, or we can listen to Jesus who said, I'm sending you out into the world and I want you to show them love and compassion and kindness. And Father, in every little way possible, if we look at someone, if we listen to them, we're sharing the love of Christ. Help us to continue to do that. Father, we just need you to be near us this time. Um, most of what we used to do is, is, is gone. But Father, we're finding that we're spending more time with family. We're thinking about things differently. We're not as focused maybe on entertainment and sports. And we're thinking about ways to serve uh, and uh, to make a difference for you. And so, Father, we just ask on this Easter Sunday that the resurrection power of Jesus and his spirit would come into us and that you would illuminate our hearts and you'd motivate us to be your people and to advance your kingdom uh, on this earth. We thank you for this time and we ask that you continue to bless 
uh, this service. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The uh, message I wanted to share with you on this uh, Easter Sunday comes from uh, John uh, 20. Uh, the title that came to me was A Locked Room and a Living Lord. Uh, Pastor Jonathan's already read uh, for you early in the, in the service the, uh, uh, the things in this chapter that lead up to the passage that I want to read to you. But let me just summarize. Uh, Mary Magdalene found a stone, the stone that was in front of Jesus' tomb that had been removed. She tells Peter, who takes off running, along with John, to see the tomb. They found strips of linen and the burial cloth on the, on the floor of the tomb. Uh, they saw and they believed, but we know they're still struggling with the idea that Jesus is alive. Peter and John returned to what was most likely the upper room where they had their last supper with Jesus while, while uh, Mary Magdalene remained weeping by the tomb. Two angels appear uh, in white and ask her why she's, why she's crying. She responds, she doesn't know where Jesus is. And as she said this, Jesus appears, but Mary thinks he's the gardener. And so Mary asks Jesus where Jesus is. Then Jesus says Mary's name. And when Mary hears Jesus say her name, she stops weeping because she knows that it's Jesus. And she says, Rabboni, teacher. Uh, and she tries to hug him, but Jesus, practicing social distancing, stops her and tells her uh, to go tell his disciples that he's alive. And then Mary finds the disciples and says, I've seen the Lord, and he spoke to me. And now I want to read to you the passage right in the middle of this uh, chapter, John 20. John 20, verses 19 to 23. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, the doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Lord has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, what uh, drew me to this passage uh, on Easter was that the disciples were locked uh, in a room in fear. The disciples are locked in a room uh, in fear. And I, I guess the question that I'd ask you is, does that sound familiar? I mean, like right now, uh, we are all isolated. We all are social distancing. We're all locked away uh, from others. We're fearful of this unseen enemy that we know as the coronavirus. So much has happened over such a short time, and it's really hard to process it all. And it was the same with the disciples on that first Easter. Over the prior week, they had entered Jer Jerusalem with Jesus on Palm Sunday as crowds cheered. Then Jesus goes into the temple and he throws out the money changers, and that set in motion their desire to finally kill him. They shared a last supper with him. They prayed with him in the garden. They saw Jesus arrested and then they all ran away except for Peter who followed Jesus at a distance but then denied him, denied that he even knew him. Jesus was tried and then he was crucified. On that first Easter, the disciples were locked in a room fearful and anxious. They were afraid of the Jewish leaders because they knew that the Jewish leaders were, um, were trying to find them, that they would arrest them and try and kill them the same way they did Jesus. They were fearful because their future was uncertain. They left everything to follow Jesus, their families and their businesses. They argued over who was the greatest. They wanted to sit on his right or his left. Uh, they, they imagined running a successful earthly ministry, but now their leader was dead. So was their hopes and so was their dreams. Fear is a powerful emotion. We feel overwhelmed, disoriented, uh, uncertain, worried, anxious, panicked. Uh, I, uh, I experienced uh, fear this past week. I was running uh, near my house, uh, and it was a beautiful, beautiful sunny day. I was having a, a great run. I was praying. I was enjoying the beautiful Easter, uh, the spring greenery, and I look over, and my neighbor's dog, a large boxer, 
found a hole in the fence and he came through that hole and he is running right at me, growling and, and, and snarling. And I went from carefree to uh, fearful. I'm backpedaling uh, in my mind. I'm thinking, I'm literally thinking, I'll slap the side of his face. And as quick as I say that, I'm thinking, well, based on the physics of how fast he's moving and whatever, by the time I slap him on the side, he's going to have my leg in his mouth. And I must have let out some kind of a primal scream uh, because uh, the, the boxer stopped about three feet from me. And then he kind of turned around, and I'm immediately thinking, get a stick or a branch so you can protect yourself. I turn around, and he's rushing at me again. And I kid you not, the thought of the, the, the movie Karate Kid came to mind. And there's this time at the end where the Karate Kid uh, goes up like this and does this, what they call a crane kick. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to do the Karate Kid thing on him. Uh, the only problem is, is I immediately thought in my mind, that's crazy because you've never done that and it's not going to work. You're going to fall over and he's going to like maul your face. And I completely panicked. And it was at that moment when he's about a foot from me that the owners of the dog run out of their garage and scream for him. And he stops just as he's about to just as he's about to bite me. The funny thing is, I remember I remember myself saying as the dog is running at me, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I can tell you when you're facing real danger, telling yourself not to be afraid doesn't work. The disciples went from the excitement of Palm Sunday to the real fear that followed the bloody crucifixion of Jesus. Locked together in a room, their fears and their anxieties multiplied as they played out worst case scenarios. And they were being pursued by religious leaders that were just as aggressive as that boxer who wanted to take me out. Fear and anxiety is running rampant in America right now. And we have re real reason to be fearful. But maybe, just maybe we can learn from what Jesus said to his disciples on that first uh, Easter while they were locked away in their room. I want, look, at, look at what Jesus did. He comforted, he commissioned, he empowered, and he directed. First of all, Jesus comforted them. It says, Jesus said, peace be with you. John 20, 19. Peace or shalom is a common greeting. It's more than safety from outside danger. It denotes an inner peace, a wholeness of heart and mind. Jesus was saying, take heart. I am here. I'm alive. It's okay. You know, Jesus' first words could have been, you idiots. I told you what was going to happen and you ran away and you left me. But Jesus spoke to them peace because he knew the kind of storm that they had been through. If you remember in this series, Jesus seems to come to us in the midst of storms and offer peace. Back in Mark 4, as the Water is, is swamping the boat and Jesus rises up from the boat and he says, peace, be still. And that time when the disciples were in another storm and Jesus in Matthew 14 walks on the water to the disciples. And you remember what he said? He said, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. When we find ourselves in a storm, it's interesting how Jesus consistently comes with a word of peace. The disciples needed to hear Jesus offer peace because they failed him. How many times have you failed someone and you don't even want to see them again because you know when you see them, they're going to remind you of what you did wrong. And so Jesus offers them peace. Shalom. Twice in our passage, Jesus says, peace be with you. Twice. Why? Because when you're dealing with people who are truly traumatized, you find yourself repeating a word of assurance over and over. When I've counseled people who are truly struggling, sometimes you come back to the same thing. Listen, it's going to be okay. You're going to get through this. You need to breathe. It's going to be okay. And you repeat that. That's what Jesus was doing with his disciples. And so Jesus is saying, peace be with you. It was his way of saying, we're good. The past is past. Let's move forward. So today, as you struggle with your life situation, can you see Jesus coming to you in the midst of your difficulty and saying, peace, peace be with you? Secondly, Jesus commissions them. He says, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. John 20, 21. These disciples were going to be called apostles, which means the sent ones. 
Jesus first comforts them and addresses their fear, and you kind of expect him to say, like, hey, let's lay low for a while, let's take it easy, let's get our bearings, it's been a rough week. But instead, he says, I got a job for you. I am commissioning you to go into all the world and make disciples. What he says at the end of uh, the gospel to Matthew, the great commission. It's interesting, we are not comforted to sit around and sing songs and, and, uh, and worship just uh, together. We're comforted and then we're sent out to serve. And so Jesus is saying, my father gave me a mission to serve and to love, and now I'm sending you. Kind of a tag, you're it. And it's true. You can lay around in a locked room, consumed with fear, talking about all the bad things that are happening, or you can get up and move out and do something. May your prayer today be, God, use me to serve. Uh, a few, about a year ago, I got an iWatch, and believe it or not, if you have an iWatch, it monitors your heart. And I'll look down during the day, and if you have an iWatch, you know this is true, and there are three words that will come up at different times during the day. One word says, breathe. I'm like, breathe? But it, it, apparently, I'm whatever I'm doing, I'm not breathing, and so it says breathe. Then you look down, and it'll say stand. And always, usually, I've been seated for a while, and my eye watch says stand, and then it's got something where it says you need to move in order to fulfill some goal. And I thought, that is good advice. Breathe, <laughs> stand, and move. Say, God, move me. How can I serve? What is Jesus sending us out to do? In Matthew 25, he tells us, he says, give food, give the hungry food and water, welcome the stranger, care for those who are sick, visit those in prison. And you know, in Matthew 25, after Jesus said this, the righteous say, Lord, when did we do that? And Jesus said, as you've done it unto the least of these, my brothers, you've done it unto me. There's a lot of people right now who are lost and alone and hurting and Jesus is sending us out to serve. I love to read some of the creative ways that people are serving each other during this pandemic, making phone calls and sending cards. We have people making meals on Wednesday. Uh, North Parkersburg Baptist has the Friendship Kitchen and it's, it's been serving a lot of people. Um, making masks, building tent hospitals, supporting people working in essential services like grocery stores or postal workers, offering art packets uh, for kids, um, using their restaurants to serve hospital staff and the public. Uh, our own Y has free Wi-Fi in their parking lot. Our YMCA is offering daycare for essential workers, and on it goes. In this time, we are doing what Jesus said. He said, I'm sending you into the world to make a difference. The world is hurting and I'm sending you into it. And Emmanuel, we have all kinds of ways that we are, we are serving. Well, if you're like me, I want to serve, but I feel weak and overwhelmed. And so that brings us to the third thing that Jesus does. Jesus empowers them. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, John 20, 22. Jesus comforts our fears. He commissions us to serve, but where do we find the strength to do it? Just as God breathed life into Adam at creation in Genesis, here we find Jesus breathing spiritual life into his disciples. The gift of the Spirit that he gives to the disciples here is a prelude to Pentecost that we read about in Acts 2. The disciples would take the lead in the early church. Peter was going to rise up and share a message, and 3,000 are going to get baptized. The gift of the, the Spirit, the giving of the Spirit, uh, is what will fill them. It will comfort them. It will convict them of sin and the spirit would guide them into all truth. And when we're filled with the spirit, the fruits of the spirit begin to grow in us and we receive a gift of the spirit, some special ability that we can use to advance God's uh, kingdom. But most importantly, the spirit empowers us. Acts 1.8, Jesus said to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all over the world. When Jesus rose, rose up into heaven, he sent down his spirit into his followers to empower us to serve and to share. Paul says in Philippians 3, he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And the power comes by the spirit living in us. Uh, Romans 8, 11, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you and me. 
and giving us life. The spirit of Jesus that raised him from the dead is living in you and me and empowering us. And so there are times when we are weak and discouraged and emotionally spent and we pray and the spirit comes and gives us life. And there are times when we are confused and disoriented and lost and we pray and the spirit comes and gives us wisdom and guidance. It's kind of like Ezekiel that had that vision in the Old Testament of a valley of dry, lifeless bones and God breathed his spirit and they all came alive. And there are some people right now that believe that that vision of Ezekiel is happening right now in America and around the world. People are isolated from one another and there's a dryness and there's a sense in which maybe God is breathing his spirit in a new way. We can't do life. We can't do ministry on our own. We need the spirit. And so we pray, God, fill me with your spirit. And then finally, Jesus directs them to focus on forgiveness. He says, if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. John 20, 23. Now, this is a challenging verse, and we can't really get into details, but only it needs to be said, only God can forgive sins. You're not God. I'm not God. So we cannot ultimately give or withhold forgiveness. But the key here is this. As we encounter people, when we, we can see and affirm an openness and a humility or a closed spirit and pridefulness that we find in people. In my life, I've had the privilege of, of praying with people who desire to follow Jesus. I've, le I've led them in this simple prayer. God, I'm sorry for my sin. I ask you for forgiveness and I accept Jesus as my Savior and Lord. And I don't know how many times after that prayer, some people will look at me and say, I don't deserve it. If, if, you knew, if you knew all the things that I'd done, I don't deserve that forgiveness. And I'll look back at them and say, you know, the Bible says if you confess your sins, that God is faithful and just, and he'll forgive you your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And I'll say to them, if you pray that prayer from your heart, you are forgiven. And I am affirming in someone who is forgiven that they are forgiven. That's, that's, the, that's the idea. I've also been with people who, who tell me that they have really no sin in their life. They really don't feel they need God. They are prideful. They're independent. And forgiveness is for weak people. And I know in my heart that they're not forgiven. I'm not God. And I don't judge them. But you can know when someone says, hey, I don't need to be forgiven. You got to wonder if they, if they know God. I remember years ago looking at one person and I said to them, you are a bitter, <laughs> miserable person. And I said, you will never be set free until you experience forgiveness. And they got upset, but it was, it was true. On this Easter, Jesus is telling us to go forth focused on the forgiveness of the gospel. It's interesting that John 20 ends with Jesus showing Thomas the scars on, on his hands and his side. And Thomas touches Jesus' scars and looks at him and says, my Lord and my God. It's interesting, the resurrected Jesus focused on his scars and not upon his resurrection body. Why is that? You know, I think he's focusing us on the whole thing that brings forgiveness. During this pandemic, people have lost everything. They're spending time thinking about their lives. And here's a powerful question. Have you been forgiven? Have you experienced forgiveness in your life? Some people will say, will say yes, I've called out to God. I, I know Jesus died for me. And we can affirm you're forgiven. Others will say, you know, I don't need forgive, forgiveness because I've never done anything all that bad. And you know in your heart where they stand with God. Let me ask you a question. Have you been forgiven by God? I know that forgiveness came to me and I remember the night and I've shared it many times to people here at Emmanuel, but I was 14 years old at a camp in Kansas City, Missouri and the speaker asked us if we would pray a prayer and I prayed that prayer asking God to forgive me and they, they hauled a huge cross up on the podium uh, and that night I focused on the cross and I knew that Jesus died for me and that's when, that's when, it, all, that's when it all came home. Forgiveness is so essential to life and to peace. It's interesting to read right now what different countries during this pandemic deem as essential. France has deemed wine and cheese essential, and so those things are open. Belgium apparently has found French fry stands essential. Liquor stores and marijuana dispensaries here and elsewhere are essential, but we know what's truly essential, and that's forgiveness. 
And Jesus said, go into the world and stay focused on the gospel of forgiveness. When Jesus was uh, crucified, there were two criminals being crucified on either side. One cursed him and said, if you're God, do a miracle and get us down from here. I imagine this person's fist was like clenched in anger because Jesus didn't fix everything in his life. The other man humbly admitted that it was their sin that had caused them to be on a cross. And he saw Jesus dying and he saw the source of life and forgiveness. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he was saying, Jesus, I've lived a horrible life and I deserve to die for the bad things that I've done. But I sense something greater, something real. I sense somebody who loves me in you, despite my sin. Jesus, I don't understand everything, but in this moment, I look to you, and I can see that you're different. You're God, and you're headed home to heaven. And when you get there, would you remember me? Better yet, Jesus, would you take me with you? And Jesus said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. This criminal, this, this uh, thief or a criminal on the cross represents the open hand. He opened his hand to Jesus by faith. The other one had a clenched fist like this saying, prove to me that you're God. But between them was Jesus with his arms open wide, offering salvation to the world through his death on the cross. And he said to them and to us, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Which one of these are you this Easter? Are you approaching God with a clenched fist of doubt or an open hand of faith? Well, not only does Jesus forgive us, but he also fights for us. Uh, you, may, you may feel like you're struggling, you're going down today, and you need Jesus just to fight for you. I mentioned earlier in the message that I was running this week when a neighbor's dog attacked, and I survived that attack, and I ran to the end of that block, and I was running back past the same house, and they were fixing the hole in the fence and uh, where that dog got out and almost bit me. And they apologized. And then the lady said to me, you know, this is the second time that he's attacked you. And I'm thinking, yeah, you want to tell me that now? She reminded me that years before their dog got out again and came for me. That time I was walking with our beagle Katie and our boxer Zeke. And somehow in the confusion, they circled me with their leashes and they had my legs completely bound up so that I could not move. And it was at that moment that I remembered so vividly our peaceful, low-key, wooden, is afraid of a shadow, boxer Zeke, took on that bully boxer full on, uh, just like kind of that slow motion scene in The Lion King at the end of the movie between Simba and Scar. And it was like our peaceful boxer Zeke rose up saying, not on my watch, not to my master. You get out of here and leave us alone. And I went home and told Mona, you'll never, you'll never believe what Zeke did. He protected me. That's a picture of the risen, what the risen Lord is doing for us today. Satan might, maybe is trying to fill you with doubts and discouragement and despair, but Jesus has risen from the tomb and he will rise up and fight for you if you'll just trust in him. What did Jesus do for his fearful disciples? He comforted them with peace. He commissioned them to serve. He empowered them by his spirit and he directed them to stay focused on the gospel of forgiveness. Let's pray. Father God, we just ask that you would give us peace in the midst of fear. Send us out to someone today who's in need that we might be able to serve. Fill us with the power of your spirit and direct us to stay focused on the gospel that offers forgiveness. Father, we know that Mary's weeping stopped when you said her name when Jesus said her name. And we know the disciples' fear ended when they saw the risen Lord. And Father, it says in our passage that the disciples were overjoyed when they saw Jesus. Father, this Easter Sunday, help us to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus because it shows that you bring good from bad times, that you bring light from darkness, and you only can bring life from death. Some of us, Father, feel dead today. Come to us, speak to us. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. I chose uh, the, the hymn, Because He Lives, because we were talking about uh, the disciples locked in a room in fear, and the chorus of this great song says, because he lives, all fear is gone.
And I pray that as you hear these words and as you think about the resurrected Lord, that you can feel some of the fear that you're feeling today begin to, begin to dissipate and, and, and leave you. So let's, let, let's sing together with us as you see the words.